All right, let's get it on. It is Cheltenham Week, and we're here with you every morning in advance of the uh, day's action, brought to you in association with Kildare Village, the most appropriate sponsor, given how stylish the two guests we have this morning are. Uh, Johnny Ward, unfortunately, is on the phone, so we don't get to see just how dapper he is in his cravat. But John Duggan, come on in from Cheltenham. How are you? Good morning to you. Chair, good morning, and everybody uh, from Kildare Village. I'm wearing a lovely blazer today that I got off winnings on a, on a, on a, on a bet of years ago. So um, you have to be sort of already dressed for Cheltenham. I haven't got the Rupert the Bear costumes yet or the Trilby, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm always well dressed to come to Cheltenham, clean shaven. And you, you have to actually present yourself in a certain way to feel like, you know, you're going to go into this week, make money, make new friends and watch brilliant racing. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that is our plan this week. It is make money. I don't care if we don't make any new friends this week, but if we make money, I suspect we're going to make... No friends, Jer. Yeah, okay, fair <laughs> enough. Come here, um, y- your stuff this week, your tips on offthewall.com uh, tend to be the highest traffic that we get for the entire year. You've already gone and uh, given us your do's and don'ts for those people who are actually attending the course. Even if you're not, it's not a bad way to uh, whet your appetite for it. But I did like the bit where you were talking about the quality of the art in the Tented Village, which got me thinking, have you actually bought a painting at Cheltenham? No, I, I, I'm just so busy and I always wanted to buy a hat because I mean I went, went all around Russia buying hats so I always wanted to buy a trilby and look like William Mullins um, not as successful obviously but um, yeah this, this amazing kind of like chalets and you know you have beautiful paintings of Istabrak and all these kind of horses called a star and dem and um, retailing for like a few hundred pounds uh, and these great hats and then you've got like warm coats and all that kind of stuff and I just never have the time and I'm always looking this is the 18th year I've gone and chat them I'm always looking and promising myself I will sort this out I will get a whole new wardrobe uh, kind of a national hunt wardrobe I bring a painting home on the back of the plane uh, and everything will be good but um it hasn't happened yet but maybe you know if if a few things go our way tuesday wednesday we might be able to buy a painting by the end of the week but actually uh, the thing about the painting is i've got a painting at home um called the final furlong which my late father had um and it's kind of it's not not a, about a specific horse it's actually just a, a, a horse in certain colors it's a beautifully uh, um painted painting um, but the horse I do want to have a painting of is Lord Galen, who's the horse that really got me into uh, jumps racing, the 1997 Grand National winner. So if I do want a horse painting, I want one of him. Yeah, well, you can uh, hopefully win enough money this week to get a commission. A, a man who does know a thing or two about uh, hats is uh, our own Johnny Ward. Johnny, as I said, unfortunately, you're on the phone today because you're travelling, so we don't actually get to see uh, how well-dressed you are. But uh, how are you uh, shaping up for uh, your, your tilt at Shetland this week? Yeah, not not too bad, Ger, not too bad. I was in Liverpool yesterday for the game, um, so watched the rugby afterwards, watched a bit of the football afterwards. So had a good day in Liverpool, up early this morning, currently travelling on the way to Cheltenham uh, in the back of a car with uh, four other passengers. I have uh, my suitcase is literally on my lap at the moment. So it's probably a good thing that um, you're not actually getting me on Skype, but I'm very excited for the for the four days. And uh, what is the gossip on the way to Cheltenham? What is the, the stuff that people talk about? Is, is any good information changing hands at the course and in the last 24 hours, or do you need to do all the work in advance? Um, well, things will change. I mean, you're, you're going to get you're going to get market movers in the you know the racing post front page story today is basically that Apple Jade has gone favourite over Boover there for the champion hurdle tomorrow. Um, but that could all change again tomorrow. You know, it's the, 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 I suppose the really heavy hitters of the gambling game um, they probably don't wager too much anti post, but they're going to be out in force uh, tomorrow. You know, the, the bets that JP McManus has had at this festival are obviously the stuff of legend, and they're all true as well. And uh, you know, how much money is he going to be placing on the likes of Sir Eric? Uh, in the Triumph Hurdle on Friday. How much is he going to be placing on Fakir Duderis, who he's bought, who runs in the first race of the Festival of Supreme? Um, so there were, there's going to be, you know, the, the racing's obviously compelling, but the market moves over the next four days are absolutely captivating as well. And um, whilst, you know, all, a lot of the money is now wagered online, the ring is still going to be very, very busy and a, a pretty magical place to be at Cheltenham. But, um, it's uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be exciting, and I suppose a big point is that Willie Mullins had a good day uh, at Nace on Sunday. He's looked like he's hitting form at the right time as well. Yeah, um, it was noticeable. I think that Ronnie Wood was hanging out with Jessica Harrington at uh, at Nace at the weekend. So I mean, there's um, the first lady of uh, rock chicks in racing is definitely Jessica Harrington. Um, John, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that kind of ebb and flow of information because obviously um, you're a man who collects intelligence. In different ways, um, it's the stu- it's the study of the form, but it's also talking to connections, uh, doing interviews. Like there's a million different data points. How do you know which are the important ones, and how do you, like which ones do you trust? 
Um, I think the first thing to do, uh, Jared, is trust your own judgment and everybody else. You trust your own judgment. If you're able to read a race card, if you're able to study form and you're able to watch races, you will actually, the, the most important judge is yourself. That's the first thing. Uh, but there are a lot of nuances to racing. Uh, which horses have traveled over? Well, for example, um, you might speak to somebody in the morning of, a, of, of the racing here in Cheltenham on the Tuesday, especially while the horse didn't travel over. Like these horses have been taken out of their environment in Ireland and, and going to a, a different country. Um, they've had a trip and like the weather hasn't been too great the last few days. Um, first time at a race course, and much more, it could be much more noisy and you see it in the bumper and things like that. And that's why a lot of the horses with experience um, often um, perform better. Um, but a lot, a lot of this is about the whispers. I mean, look, like for, look, for example, the bumper on Wednesday, the declarations came out in the last hour. Joseph O'Brien's got a horse called Meticulous, beautifully bred, owned by Michael Tabor, or part of the, um, in, it was involved at Bally Doyle. And Donald O'Brien is now riding the horse. So Joseph's brother, who rode, I think, the Derby winner for him last year, is riding Meticulous in the bumper at Cheltenham. That is a very, very unusual thing. So you have to look at the nuances. Um, Willie, as Johnny said, had a good day yesterday. Uh, so uh, who's informed? Paul Nichols has had a great season in England. Um, he's got probably a better class of horse than he has had the last few years. So you just have to use common sense and and try and like filter through what the market is saying, what you have judged yourself to date with your own eyes through looking at form, yeah. uh, and then also uh, also trusting Jer. You know, good good judges in in racing who have different opinions, and then like just using their opinions as information, but not to go against your own opinion, but to confirm it. Yeah, Johnny, about that, the, the, that's a, a nice little tidbit of information that uh, Dunica is going to be riding a Joseph O'Brien horse that is owned by Michael Tabor. We tend to think of um, racing as a cold-blooded cut and thrust, but when it comes to Cheltenham, there seems to be quite a significant amount of emotion involved. So I can't imagine Dunica is riding for the crack of it. He, uh, he wants to win. Um, does that change your opinion on what's going to happen when you so, see decisions being made like that? It's, it's significant that Donica rides that horse, as, as John says, very well bred out of the very good race where refinement. And um, Donica riding in that race would probably be a point or two its chance because they would, uh, you know, look for an emotional success in the family. You know, it might well be his only ever winner at Cheltenham. Um, Lord knows he's not going to be riding for that much longer anyway because of his weight, and he's not going to go over jumps to the best of my knowledge. Whether it's actually a plus for the horse's chance is another thing. I personally probably prefer um, national hunt jockeys in that race. I, I don't really think flat jockeys are, are um, kind of all that well attuned to ride in that race it's a different test Cheltenham is, is a very idiosyncratic track as well but having said that Dunica will certainly be well prepped for it um, so it, it, the point you make about emotion this, 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 this festival matters more than any other there's no doubt about it every single winner is celebrated with uh, you know the jockey punching the air across the line that doesn't happen elsewhere um, there's a cauldron of, 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 of Cheltenham that basically is incomparable to anywhere else um, it's a big Irish-English battle and just if you are punting over the week you know just Bear in mind that there are four days, you know, four days, seven races each day, 28 races. Um, don't don't uh, panic. Certainly don't stake more than you can afford um, because things can turn around quickly if, you're, if you've had a few losers. And most of all, enjoy it because uh, there's nothing like it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, Johnny, about your strategy when it comes to that, that kind of stuff. Um, are you more interested in trying to find intel that the rest of the market doesn't have to find a little bit of value? Or are you strictly studying form, course and distance, that kind of stuff? I think uh, Jer and Johnny at Cheltenham, everybody's trying. I'm not saying they're not trying anywhere else, but I think everybody's gearing their um, whole winter towards this week. So every horse, every jockey, every trader, they're on top of their game. So to me, I, 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 I'm not going to discount a 20 to 1 shot just because it's a 20 to 1 shot, because every body here is, is going and trying their best, right? So, for example, I'm looking at the champion chase. The declarations came out in the last hour. Nine declared, Altier the favourite, but Footpad does not run. Undeso does not run. They're scared of Altier. They're shirking Altior because Min uh, is still in the race, but Altior looks to me to be a bomb-proof bet based on what we've seen all year, right? So what I'm looking for when I'm looking at Cheltenham, I think course form is a huge thing. Horses coming back and winning year after year and also horses that have performed maybe at hurdles at festivals coming and then winning chases so it is a unique track it's not a flat track like ascot or uh kempton uh, or entry is a flat track entry or ascot uh, really um like in ireland we have like for example the curra on the flat is a very flat track at cheltenham it's all about the undulations you have to be able to travel at cheltenham because you're constantly twisting and turning you're constantly turning and then you're going up a hill then you're going down a hill and then you've got a stiff uphill finish and on soft ground it's good to soft ground soft in places at the moment it's going to rain tomorrow morning Look, it's not going to be bottomless ground, but it's going to be soft ground. So you'll need horses, for example, a classical dream is a gutsy horse who won a grade one at Leopardstown. 
probably was going to go for the two and a half mile race, but because of the ground conditions and the fact that it's going to be um, a faster pace than a lot of these horses have encountered this season, um, that's why Willie Mullins, I think, is declared him for the two mile race tomorrow. Jockey bookings are really important. Who's Ruby riding? Who's uh, Paul Townend riding for Willie? Um, and of course, Paul has been mainly the leading jockey this season in Ireland, which is something you can't discount. So the more you know, the better your chance. Uh, but it's a case of, as Johnny said, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and I look, I look at the first two races tomorrow and I see that they're quite difficult to work out. So I'd rather have one or two uh, good winners here this week, maybe at a price, than try to get involved in 10 or 15 races. Yeah, and John, we'll come back to the, the declarations and the, the state of the, um, the rest of the information that's coming from the track. But Johnny Ward, just to, to get your view on the ground, because all winter we've been talking about how the ground has been good effectively every single time there has been racing, and yet now it looks like the ground isn't actually going to be good on the uh, first day anyway. So what difference does that make to all of the form book that we've been studying since last summer? Um, I don't think it'll make an awful lot of difference, to be honest. The ground is good to soft, soft in places, the last part. There is going to be a bit of rain, but, uh, you know, the, it's, it's basically impossible that you're going to have really testing ground because there hasn't been any rain of, of note really for months uh, in general. So they've done bits of watering, obviously, to with a view to having good to soft ground tomorrow at the very slowest, at the very fastest, rather. Um, but it's not, I mean, people shouldn't be getting fretting about it, uh, turning up heavy ground form or anything like that. It was it was proper testing last year by Cheltenham Sanders. It's not going to be proper testing this year because you can't just, ground doesn't turn heavy over the course of a couple of days. You know, the water levels would be definitely lower, much lower than they, they, they should be, certainly in Ireland this year. Obviously, some of the Irish horses go to Cheltenham maybe with a little bit less experience than would be ideal. Um, you, you even look at the likes of Battle Over Die, and he's had a couple of hurdle runs. Um, you know, and he again, he's a horse who would want soft ground, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't fret too much about the ground. It's not going to really be an excuse. Um, you know, what happened in Leopardstown in the Dublin Race Festival where they had 20 non-runners and the ground was genuinely far too quick. That's not going to happen. Um, it's going to be nice spring ground, um, a little bit softer maybe than Envisage, but it's really not going to be any excuse for anyone. Okay, so kind of perfect conditions then? Yeah, absolutely perfect conditions. And um, it's, it's just sad that we haven't had more of this in Ireland over the winter because it's been a bit of a shambles of a campaign in that regard. Yeah, all right. John, the uh, the declarations you're saying are, are starting to come out thick and fast. Um, uh, just recap what you said about Altior, will you? Yeah, Altior is facing um, eight rivals in the champion chase. Uh, so what they're doing, Jer, here, uh, and it's a welcome development in the last couple of years, they're de declaring 48 hours out. So yesterday they declared the horses for tomorrow's opening day. So we know already what's running tomorrow. Um, so they declared in the last hour the race uh, horses for Wednesday. So footpad, we might have expected to line up in the two-mile champion chase, does not. We'll probably run in the two-and-a-half-mile Ryanair chase. Under so again, not declared for the two-mile champion chase. So Altior, Min is his only real rival. He'd beaten Min twice before. Um, meticulous, as I said, with Joseph O'Brien training him. Dunnock O'Brien, a very unusual selection, a flat jockey in the bumper race. It has been done before. In 2002, Jamie Spencer rode Pizarro to win for Edward O'Grady. Um, so it has been done before that a flat uh, jockey has won a bumper here at Cheltenham. Uh, Santini uh, was a doubt for uh, Nicky Henderson in the Sun Alliance Novices chase, but he will run. He's declared to run on Wednesday uh, against Delta Work on top of the game. They're the three main uh, protagonists in that one. But other than that, we pretty much know what's going to happen. We got the champion hurdle declarations in from yesterday. Apples Jade, Lorena and Bouvier Jair could be the race of the festival, Jair, and we can't wait for that one. I think Johnny's right up at the ground. Don't think it's going to be bottomless. No, just a little bit softer than normal. Uh, but once again, what I would say is the horses... Um, will run faster than they've ever ran. Like a, a half one tomorrow, there's going to be an almighty roar, uh, up to six, probably over 60,000 people here at Cheltenham for the Supreme Novices Hurdle, and they go an almighty clip. And there are a lot of uh, good horses in that race, and there is no hiding place at Cheltenham. You need luck, you need a good jockey, you need a good position, uh, but you need ultimately the best horse in the race. And that's what we're going to try and find out over the next few days. Johnny, obviously a lot of people uh, watching this today who are making their way to Cheltenham. Um, we've got John's uh, do's and don'ts and his hints and tips for people heading over on offtheball.com. If you were to talk about the bit that you enjoy the most, is it is it the betting ring and watching how the markets are moved by the big punters coming in with the sharp money at the very last minute? Yeah, I do. I do enjoy that. Um, it's it's you know even last year you had massive gambles on like the likes of Mel and I remember in the Champion Hurdle very nearly came off. Um, you will see that, and certainly in the handicaps this this uh, see, this 
2019 Cheltenham there are going to be a lot of horses going in that um, are a little bit under the radar because they haven't maybe run that much in Ireland this season And um, but just, it's just the whole experience you know it, I'd say it's a quarter to a third of the crowd is Irish it felt like that in Liverpool yesterday actually but it's certainly like that in Cheltenham it's, it's a huge huge draw for Irish race, go- race scores and uh, basically you know Willie Mullins and, and Gordon Elliott were head to head last season in terms of winners they completely dominated it's not going to be like that this this year I think um, Gordon Elliott and Willie probably will have to settle for second or third behind uh, Nicky Henderson I think but um, at the same time just the, the the patriotism kind of does mean something it just kind of shows the state of Irish racing versus British and um, you, you cheer on the Irish winner even if you haven't backed it and I think there are a lot of races this Shelton where you probably should be having a small stakes bet or no bet at all but as John says you know with the, the all the artwork and uh, the fashion there's just there's so many aspects to Cheltenham it's a beautiful part of England as well if you can stay around in places like Winchcombe um, it's really idyllic and um, it's just a great great festival Come here why, why do you think this is uh, a festival where people will be avoiding having big stakes is it because so many of the horses are underexposed given the weather we've had is that is that the knock on impact <laughs> Yeah, it's just strange. I mean, if you look at the, the Supreme and the Arkell, um, I, they're, to me, they're pretty underwhelming renewals of the race. Maybe, uh, maybe it'll turn out, often these races turn out better than they look at the time, but, like, the Arkell is a, is a, is a bang average renewal of the race. The, the Supreme, there are 18 runners. I honestly haven't a clue what's going to win it. I put up Angel's Breath, but equally, I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't even in the first four, because he's only had a few runs as well. It's just, there are a lot of trappy races this year, and probably the fact that horses haven't run as much because of the ground means that, you know, it, it, it's it's just a little bit more difficult to kind of be sure about your farm lines as opposed to other years. Yeah, and sorry, the other thing that um, John was talking about earlier on is like just getting to the, the course and, and talking to uh, head boys who've travelled over with the horses to know whether or not they've travelled well. All that kind of stuff that like the rest of the world doesn't find out about until they see a move in the market. Oh, absolutely, it's um, and, and and horses boiling over as well. You know, it's 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 going to be um, a lot of horses won't be able mentally for the challenge that Cheltenham is going to represent. That's going to change the market. If a if a horse gets basically um, fractious beforehand, which some horses certainly will this week, you have to keep an eye out for that. That's why the you know the parade ring is so crowded before racing. It's very hard to get a good vantage point, but you're going to learn plenty by just being at Cheltenham. Talk to people, talk to connections. Um, you know. There's plenty of time to chat, and uh, you, you can certainly get late information. Like, certainly, the, the markets are are still fluid. Like, there's no, there's nothing to say that there won't be some big gambles between now and Friday evening. All right, this is uh, our daily Cheltenham show. We're here with you in association with Kildare Village. You can get all the information that you need at kildarevillage.com. We're going to be here every morning at around about half past eleven with uh, a cast of characters uh, talking you through the day's races. Um, John, to look forward to the Gold Cup. Uh, presenting Percy is all over the Irish newspapers. All the um, various newspapers have produced their supplements today and there's great work going on um, and some great stories about the, the background to the horse and they've even managed to get some words from the uh, notoriously shy trainer. Um, what, what's your expectation this far out from the Gold Cup about what's going to happen? Well, I think uh, what presenting Percy signifies for me, Jer, is what Cheltenham is all about, which is a storyline. I mean, not many great horses are trained out west uh, just because just of the way it is. Um, it hasn't happened in 90 years that a horse has turned up uh, at a Gold Cup and won it without having had a run that season over fences. So it's a storyline. So what is Cheltenham all about? It's all about storylines. Back to Arkell, back to, back to Isterback, Dawn Run, the only merit to win the champion hurdle and uh, the Gold Cup. Uh, back to Hardy Eustace, Hardy Bald. And in recent years, Ireland winning 19 races two years ago. Embarrassing, really, for the home contingent. So presenting Percy is a storyline, right? Um, very hard, though, to judge against senior horses in grade ones, how he's going to perform. But on the on the book of what we've seen so far, he won the novice chase here very, very impressively last year. That's why he's favourite. But there is a little bit of unknown with presenting Percy. Clande Zobo was the best home horse here. Paul Nichols trained, won the best trial traditionally, which is the King George at Kempton. Uh, is an improving horse. Uh, Clan des Obo, uh, jumps well. Harry Cobden will ride him, and Alex Ferguson, a part owner of the horse. Uh, so they're quite confident behind him. Nature River, Richard Johnson was at a panel I was at last night. Very confident with the softer ground that's forecast and further rain forecast in the week about Native River going back to the back. That's not done very often. Best made the last horse to do it in 2003. And then a couple, and Willie Mullins then is the other storyline, Jer. Uh, 61 winners at Cheltenham, and he's never won the Gold Cup. He's had uh, six second place finishes. He's got four. A dart to the board, album photo, invitation only, Camboy and Bells Hill. So it'd be great to see Willie finally win the Gold Cup that his dad, Paddy, 
did in 1986 with Dawn Run. So um, to me at the moment, album follow is the one I like each way. Uh, but a lot of things can happen between now and then. We need to see what the declarations are. But presenting Percy would be the story that would lift the roof uh, from an Irish perspective. Yeah, um, Johnny, we, we did uh, a show with Ollie Bell and he was making the point that presenting Percy hasn't quite won over the British public just yet. And uh, I was reminding him of um, his win in the Thiestes and how that day presenting Percy gets welcomed back into the parade ring, uh, or into the winner's enclosure, the same way that legendary Irish horses have been in the past. So presenting Percy clearly has this symbiotic link with the Irish racing public. It's kind of time that that went global, right? It's like he's, he's a good enough horse to be able to uh, carry off becoming and passing into legend. Yeah, he, he's he's. Um, I suppose if the British are ambivalent towards him, it's the fact that you know he doesn't run in Britain very often. He comes over for Cheltenham, that's it. And uh, winning the RSA Chase doesn't mark you down as a spectacular horse, even in the manner that he did it, which was uh, ultra impressive. Uh, there's also the fact that his trainer is um, antagonistic towards the media, so that probably wouldn't go down well in Britain where they seem to value um, you know your, your media relationship quite a lot um, Jim Bulger uh, obviously famously declared new approach for the derby when he'd been more or less ruled out of the race and was quite uh, slow to tell the media because he'd uh, I think he'd slept he basically fell asleep that evening or that's what Jim's story anyway but uh, he, the horse didn't get a great reception when he won the derby at Epsom which was kind of a bit strange it wasn't really the horse's fault but I think if presenting Percy wins the Gold Cup on Friday which I think he's a huge chance of doing uh, there would be a hell of a reception for him from the Irish and the British because they'll appreciate that this is a beautiful beautiful horse he does represent underdogs in that his trainer only has a handful in a racing backwater in the west of Ireland where we never have anything like a Gold Cup horse and uh, you know he also has links to Albert Reynolds who would have been a very very popular man his son obviously tr owns the horse Albert was uh, one of the more likeable politicians we've had uh, in Ireland in, in, the, in, in our past and uh, you know he's, he represents uh, the underdog basically and racing loves that Race, Irish race goers love the underdog that's why Denoli was so popular he's trained by Tommy Tracy but written by Tommy Tracy rather and trained by Tommy Tom Foley, we love an underdog, and presenting Percy is very much that. And um, just to add to the whole story, you know, his prep has been so utterly unconventional that it just makes it all the more alluring. Yeah, for sure. It's the narrative <coughs> that John Duggan is talking about. John, to, to kind of bring the focus back um, before we wrap here to day one, um, are you changeable? Could somebody convince you about a horse that's running, or did you make your mind up on when you saw the declarations yesterday for the first day? Do you have to wait until tomorrow to see just how bad that rain is tomorrow morning, or what is your punting strategy on a day like that? Uh, my punting strategy, Jer uh, and Johnny and everybody, is to wait until the last moment, and I can change my mind, and I could have maybe what I try to do is narrow things down. So I've narrowed the champion hurdle down to three horses: Apples Jade, Lorena, and Esquire Dwellen. Uh, who is a five-year-old, and five-year-olds don't tend to win the champion hurdle, but I've narrowed it down. I don't fancy Blue Verdere, I don't fancy Verdana Blue. Uh, I don't really fancy Melon either. Um, so what I tried to do is narrow it down to three or four, and maybe and, and if one stands out, that means I've got a strong fancy on that one. So I have a strong fancy for top of the game on Wednesday in the Sun Alliance and Offices Chase. I've got a strong fancy already for that. That is a good sign for me. But I will read the racing post. I, what I'll spend the rest of the day doing is I'll just do the card myself. It'll probably take me two to three hours, go through every single horse. I'll watch maybe some race replays, and then I'll make my own judgment on the basis of ground conditions, um, you know, whether the horse is a good jumper. You've got to jump well around Cheltenham, who the jockey is, what the weight is, all that kind of thing. So, But I will, I will also look at other judges, and I'll make my mind up very late. Well, just to go back, when you're saying you're ruling certain horses out, what are the things that you're looking for that makes you go, ah, that's not for me? Well, with Bouverdere, for example, he's had two very ordinary runs in the last 12 months. Well, look, he got beaten by Verdana Blue at Kempton in the Christmas hurdle by a horse that's 20 pounds rated inferior to him and also was uh, neck and neck with Mellon in last year's champion hurdle. Looking back on the last two champion hurdles, to me, they have been ordinary renewals. And the, at a price, I can't have Bouverdere. You can't trust him. Only five horses have won the champion hurdle and he has no Istabrak. And I can't see him winning the third champion hurdle. I think with also with the, the weight that the mayors, Apples, Jade and Arena are getting, I can't see him beating both of them. And I, I can't work out between the two who's going to win. I think Apples, Jade will win it. Um, but that's why I'm ruling out uh, Boo Verdere. Verdana Blue has run poorly at the festival twice. And to me, he's a flat track bully. 
So Verdana Blue might be a 20 to 1 shot, but I'd lay him all day, lay him for 100 quid for two grand. Uh, now, that's probably, um, you know, uh, professional talk, as it were. Um, but that, that, that's the kind of thing I'm looking at. And I, I, I tell you this, Jared, I will be able to pick horses that are going to lose here a lot easier than I'll be able to pick horses that are going to win here this week. It's a, it's a useful, important uh, aspect. Um, uh, we're kind of more interested in the winners, but... Uh, <laughs> well, well I, got, I, got to, I, got to, I got to get you winners. I've had 11 years profit out of 17 at Chatham. I'm very proud of it. Yeah. I'm very proud of it. Um, I'm protectively proud of it. And I'm determined to get winners. There'll be no, and people will say this to me on the, on the street, oh, well, what about the ones you keep for yourself? I'm keeping nothing for myself here this week on offtheball.com and on the, on the radio stations I'll be broadcasting on. Everything I say to you is the truth and is what I believe. Johnny, what about you? Do you pick losers to try and uh, narrow fields or do you kind of try and um, pick a single individual horse and follow that to the point where you're like, okay, this is well placed, I understand why they put it in this race and how it's going to happen? Yeah, well, I certainly pick losers, but often I end up backing them, which is the problem. Um, but we know we, we endeavour to persevere. Um, like John, I'll try to be uh, as honest as I can this week, you know, um, but I'll certainly give as much information as I can. Um, you know, I, I, I've laid horse at Cheltenham as well. It, it, I remember laying Coney Gree in, in running when he won the Gold Cup. Uh, that wasn't a particularly pleasurable experience, but uh, there are loads of different strategies. And um, I would strongly advise as well to look at, what the bookmakers are offering because they are basically fighting each other to offer more incentives this week than any other week. They want people in the shops. They want people who don't normally bet to have a bet. I mean, I think one bookmaker might even be offering seven places in the Supreme, which is absolutely bonkers, but so be it. You can go and have a bet for, for each way, and if you finish seventh, you'll, you'll come home with some money in a very open renewal of the race. Um, just keep an eye out uh, for what the bookmakers are offering. It'll be very easy to find out, and uh, if you were ever to have a bet, this is a good week to do it because there are huge incentives, um, but just do be conscious that uh, you can get you know, you can get quite stressed if you're backing a lot of losers, and be cognizant of the fact that it's only four days, and uh, we'll, we'll all be alive on Friday evening and not to get ahead of yourself, but if you do have a winner, make sure to enjoy it because it's extra special. Yeah, um, just to briefly finish up with um, the Apples Jade, Lorena Bouverdere conversation that we were having there with John Duggan. Johnny, what do you make of, of that renewal of the race? Um, you know, Verdana Blues, 16 to 20 to 1, Melons at around 14, and um, it does look like it's a hard race to pick. Yeah, it's, it's a great race. So the Gold Cup and the Champion Hurdle are smashing, smashing races this year, and uh, this race is one for the ages with two mares in the top three in the betting, which is very unusual in a champion hurdle. Lorena, um, as has been said a million times at this stage, people still don't really know quite how good she is. We probably know how bad she isn't. Uh, but I, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the vibes have been quite strong about her. I think she's capable of running a big race. I'm very much against Apple J, despite the fact that she's produced extraordinary visual performance this season. Uh, for me, she hasn't really done it at Cheltenham. She, she leans right. If she's taken on up front, it's a, it's a really tight turn in track for the champion um, I, I just couldn't really have her Boover there I'd be pretty, pretty willing to take him on as well I think he fell in the race last year when it was a pretty moderate renewal this year is much much tougher and he's, he hasn't exactly set the world alight this season either um, so if I were to give you advice for the champion hurdle I'd have two bets one on Lorena and one on Esper Dallin who Gavin Cromwell uh, wasn't going to run but has changed his mind over the past few weeks it seems and gave me a very very positive bulletin about his general well-being having worked him at Navin uh, the other day uh, he was talking to me yesterday he's very happy with him he does have a fair bit to find um, but he, again a little bit like um, Lorena he, we haven't really reached the ceiling with him and he is about 20 to 1 and he's trained by a master yeah alright ok well, uh, we do like the uh, small bet outside each way tips as well um, final question for you Johnny should um, John Duggan go and buy a hat and just be done with it isn't that the right thing to do give him some advice uh, Yes, basically, effectively, yes, but he should uh, buy it off FAO Millinery um, if he doesn't. Um, just give a little plug there to the uh, to the organisation. Um, she'll, she'll, she'll find him a hat that'll suit his, uh, his needs. And John he has an eye for hats based on what he did in Russia. Um, certainly has an eye for hats. There you go. The, the Milner will be happy. Uh, John, there you go. I mean, there's not much more left for us to do in our Cheltenham preview, but for are, what, if, is there a particular one you have your eye on? Well, it's funny, my nephew uh, asked for a horse's head. You know those kind of um, <laughs> latex masks for his birthday? Oh, yeah, and I was yeah, thinking, yeah. thinking myself of bringing it over on the boat or, or on, the, on the plane, and I decided not to because um, it'd be a bit just uh, silly and I'd be trying to wear your headphones through it. But I think I'm going to get a trilby, Jer and Johnny. I'm going to get a trilby. I'm going to wear it on Off the Ball AM or one of the shows here. Um, and the trilby will be full of money, full of sterling. That's actually worth a lot of money at the moment. So who's going to know in about a year's time? But it's, it's going to be worth a lot of... 
uh, yeah, a lot of red 50 pound notes are going to be under that trilby by the end of the week folks good stuff John and Johnny thanks a million for uh, joining us on the first of our five uh, Cheltenham shows brought to you in association with Kildare Village we're going to be here every day and sure as I said we're better than um, Kildare Village to partner with us this week even Kildare is the best racing county in the world temporary kind of second but uh, that's our lot for today we'll be back tomorrow with a full race by race preview of what's going to happen tomorrow and then on Wednesday we'll have a bit of a look back and how we get on on Tuesday and uh, we'll roll the preview through as ever if you want to get in touch with us so you can drop us a comment and if you've got a specific horse you'd like the lads to talk about you can uh, just hit us up with uh, on Twitter at off the ball and we'll um, be back with the Cheltenham show tomorrow around about half past 11 good luck <laughs>